This is Bob Andelman, and this is the Mr. Media Interview. I think the reason that many people who never read comic books find themselves drawn to graphic novels isn't because they come in hardcover or because they cost more or because they're hip at the moment. I think it's because we're more likely to find little pieces of ourselves in the stories, which are often more autobiographical than Spider-Man or Green Lantern could ever be. At least that's the thought I kept returning to as I read through Peter Cooper's latest graphic novel, Stop Forgetting to Remember. The youthful sexual frustration, the aimlessness, the side comments to no one in particular, the social doubts, the eagerness slash anxiety over fatherhood, the pain of maintaining adult friendships. There were so many things that could have been ripped from my own life that I couldn't put the book down. Cooper, whose previous graphic novels include Sticks and Stones, the system, and an adaptation of Franz Kafka's The Metamorphosis is perhaps most widely recognized as the artist behind Mad Magazine's legendary Spy vs. Spy these days. And his strip The Virgin was optioned by HBO as well as actor Forrest Whitaker's production company. Peter, welcome to Mr. Media. Thank you. Uh, Peter, your book is technically the autobiography of Walter Kurtz, but where does he end and you begin? Uh, they're, they, they sort of segue into one another. I, I think of it as being an autobiography. <laughs> it's, it's, um, it, it gave me enough room to, when I wanted to change the story and uh, uh, have the whatever happened serve uh, the story instead of being stuck with the facts, if it were an absolute, you know, auto uh, memoir. And. Uh, um, but there, it gets very blurry, and uh, um, I, um, I recognize much of myself in him, and we join together in our coming of middle age story. <laughs> what would be an example of, of a uh, Peter Cooper fact or a Walter exaggeration? Well, uh, there's a, uh, I have a friend in the story who um, uh, I meet in, during the story, and uh, he's another father, and in reality it's somebody I knew for a while. And I, I gave him all the lines that I, I, I would have wanted to say, and, <laughs> but, but then overlaid his personality on it. Um, at any given juncture, if I wanted to have uh, I keep the characters narrow, so I wouldn't be I wouldn't keep adding on new characters. I might uh, fuse two people together into one. Um, generally speaking, uh, he and I share a great deal in common, including birthday. <laughs> And, and what about on the family side? You, uh, you, you have your uh, parents there early on, and then uh, wife, daughter. Yeah, it's all pretty much the, you know all those things sort of line up. Um, and they, uh, I, at one point, I was having a, a fight with my wife, and I had just come back uh, from at my studio, working on that section of the book where I was drawing a fight with my wife, <laughs> as or it was would be uh, Walter's wife, and. I thought, wow, the dialogue is perfect. It's exactly, I got it exactly right. And I, I was having that dual thought while I felt like I was Walter and myself simultaneously with my my uh, stand-in wife, Sandra, and my real wife, Betty. <laughs> and and what does your real wife think of being uh, portrayed in the book? She gets, she gets final edit on her panel. So oh, there's, there were the occasions where, you know, she said, you made me too fat here. <laughs> I said, well, I'm, I'm trying to demonstrate that there's a passage. Okay, I'll make you thinner. <laughs> um, but they're, they're, overall, she, she gave me the big thumbs up, as, as did many of my friends, although um, I did find in the end um, I had friends who were angry with me for not putting them in the book and friends who were angry with me for putting them in the book, so I figured I'd... I must be doing something right. <laughs> uh, I, uh, your wife also had the opportunity to uh, put put up a hand at one point when you're in the bedroom. Say no. Yes, there's no. <laughs> you, hey, that's, the, that's the edit on the panels. Yeah, okay. Now, did you put that in, or did she suggest that you put that in? No, she. You know, it was in the air. <laughs> um, no, she didn't. She didn't uh, pressure me per se. It was more like my general knowledge of. Uh, what what would uh, pass with her, and that was uh, I, I figured that was the line that she wouldn't want me to cross, which is you know, I, I have, us having, say, demonstrating uh, um, various sexual positions. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, and Monday through Sunday. <laughs> that I can do with you know old girlfriends is a different story, but I see. The, 
the one I'm still married to, a little different. I see, I see. And um, uh, what about your daughter? Uh, do you have a do you have a daughter? I assume. I do. Okay. Um, yeah. Well, um, she. I, I. There was that difficulty of um, uh, having what I could show her in the book because it does get into some territory I don't want her to see. And she was nine when I was working on the book, so I could show her sections that she appeared in, um, and uh, just. Um, so she she has sort of a general idea what's going on there, but curiously. As I was working on the story, certain events took place that um, uh, were I was able to fold into the story, and it helped me figure out, um, you know, parts of it. So, you know, for example, at one point I went to kiss her, and she didn't want me to kiss her goodbye, and that that would that was a perfect uh, emblematic moment in time, mm-hmm. and it happened right during, you know, right when I was coming up on that part of the book where I would be looking for something that demonstrated how she's growing up. Um, and uh, th- that actually happened also when I was working on um, uh, the wordless book, Sticks and Stones, because I had I was looking for something that would be a connector between a um, mother and son, and at that moment in time, my daughter was learning how to whistle. Hmm. And I was like, ah, there you go. It's, it, that'll work perfectly. So occasionally these things kind of line up um, and, um, and offer up the next step in a story that you're trying to figure out. Now, how old is your daughter now? She's 10. Oh, okay. So this this doesn't go back that far. No, no. I was working on it right up until uh, the time that we, well, I was working on it even down here in Mexico where I'm speaking to you from. Okay. Well, this is where I was confused. How long uh, did, did this book take you to produce? Well, I worked on it. Uh, the earliest stories in there I did as far back as 13 years ago. Okay. I was then then I and I had started on different parts of this at different points in time, but but uh, I didn't I certainly didn't work on it nonstop for 13 years. I worked on it um, uh, very you know like a, a my hard drive to finish the book took about a year and a half. Um, but there but I had been working on sections of it over the years, and then as it came together, then I used parts of different stories that I had done before that all folded into. A bigger picture. Okay, this is what I was. I, was, I wanted to get a sense of that because I finished reading the book, and I thought uh, this must have been done over a period of years. Also, because it seemed like it seemed like early on that the narrator is more present than he is later in the book. Mm-hmm. Is that is that a fair? Well, the, the, the idea of um, I'm I'm doing these stories. I mean, it's a, it's a story within within a story, so that I'm working on the graphic novel itself. Right, right. And the, these jump backs in the past, a lot of them were actually about, uh, as I was coming up on parenthood, there's kind of a line in the book where I go from not being a parent to having a kid. And in that first part of the book, there's a lot more of that memory and going back and looking at the you know, past experiences, trying to lose my virginity, <laughs> various drug experiences and bad old relationships. And that slows down after I have the child, and as it, you know, that I'm not doing as much um, reflecting on my whole life there as dealing with having a child. Okay. Yeah, and it also seemed, um, in terms of the art, it seemed a little less uh, frantic or frenetic, maybe is a better word, uh, as as things were on. It was fascinating in the early part of the book, that pre-marriage, pre-child part, where. Um, there was so much going on. There was, it seems like there was so much packed into all the panels. But part of that, of course, is is the drug use relationship and the, the, the and, and the addled at the time. Yeah, and, and the the the. the uh, uh, the pursuit of sex because you're you're saying one thing you're thinking another thing and something a third thing is happening so uh, it was really you know it was really interesting um, do, do you feel any um, hesitation at revealing so much uh, of yourself um, absolutely that that's part of why I have a alter ego there it's for de- deniability purposes um, and some of it is that I um, once you kind of put your toe in the water, it, it seemed, I mean, at least in my experience, progressively it I kind of started opening new doors and, I, and that, that would lead to something else where, I, where that was, uh, you know, another step in being revealing. And once I kind of got far enough in there, then, I, then it, it made it 
I, I felt less inhibited about doing that. And um, I just find that I'm, I'm sort of trying to get at uh, some kind of truth, whatever that is, and that the more I, I do something where I feel like, whoa, this is, this is so embarrassing, and I, do I really want to go here? I think odds are pretty good that I'm in the right territory for stumbling upon something that is, has some value to it. And what's also kind of curious is that um, when people have seen these stories, the things that I think of as being most private, embarrassing, and I was the only person this happened to, are the ones that are invariably turn out to be universals where, you know, the, many people say, oh, yeah, that's exactly what happened to me. You know, <laughs> yeah, I lied about, you know, saying I wasn't a virgin anymore or, or, or a million things. But um, it, so that's, that's part of the idea is getting at, the, at this, this, this kind of truth that, that um, I feel is, you know, there's so much covered up and not talked about and that it's, it's a way that you can make uh, stories like this have some actual import, you know, be useful beyond just me doing it for myself. Mm. Now, what uh, the... Uh Gee, what can I say about it without giving it away? The uh, the, the the section with you and uh, the char- well, I'm sorry, with Walter, your alter ego, and Vicky and Keith, uh, that came to a conclusion that I did not see coming. Uh, that, <laughs> uh, I, I don't want to give that away because I really think people should read that and not not, not see that coming. But uh, I mean, that was an extremely if 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 that was even close to reality, that was an extremely close. Uh, I don't know. Close, I don't want to say close to the heart, but close I mean, encounter of the third. Close encounter, yeah. I mean, that was that was different. Uh, did yeah. that one give you any pause in terms of sharing that? You could have skipped over that part had you yeah, chosen to. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Lots of pause, lots of uh, shaking, nervousness, and uh, at like what's going to happen? Why have I done this? I generally think that the artist has no idea, and uh, um, I think you know when you look at you, you see explanations for why people do things, and that that they're their explanations, but they don't fully, um, they don't necessarily cover it all. And there's a lot of things that I've done with the stories or, you know, certain stories I'm telling that I'm not wholly sure why I'm, I'm let, letting loose on something. On the other hand, there's a lot of great guideposts and people who have been influences like R. Crumb, who sort of represents the let it all hang out and, you know, take your chances with that. Mm. And, uh, you know, I'm I, relative to some, some of the things that, that say he talks about. I'm just putting my toe in the water, but it, it's all. It's it, it's. Uh, it was this this kind of. Um, I have these stories that I'm interested in telling, and when they 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 had so many different facets to them that I, I just thought, well, that just makes such a good story. Why would I not want to tell it? And uh, um, and now you know when the book comes out, then I'll see what the payoff actually is. Mm-hmm. As I chase down the street by. <laughs> Now I, I was going to ask you about Crumb because I was thinking that when he does these stories, it, it's just it's just him in the stories. He's there's no there's no alter ego directly. I mean he well there yeah. 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 So I, I was going to ask you about that. Why you know why why do the alter ego thing? Uh, even I, and I noticed that even your uh, like your press picture is is half Walter, half you. Right. I love that. I, like I said, I found, well, deniability being the first one, but the, the second one was there was something about not having it be specifically me where I felt like I had a certain degree of freedom mm. to step away from myself and look at myself as a character, first of all, but also look at the, the stories and experiences and make make them work best as a story and not have the, the reality... Um, impinge on how I would do that if I if I want to make it you know if I want to make alterations I there was just a certain degree of freedom in that if I said it was straight up me and it was an autobiography then I could go the James uh, Fry route and do a million little pieces and, and make it up as I go along and call it a memoir or I could just sort of say I'm gonna make up where I want to you don't know where the line begins and ends and um, it, there there was a lot of freedom in that mm. um, but you know the fact is the the real details are much more interesting than anything I'm gonna, I can make up, and so that for the most part I kin to what happened, and because that that gives, gives it a certain richness, um, you know, what do they say, God or the devils in the details, and uh, that was certainly true in making these stories. Hmm. 
one of the big turning points in the book, uh, aside from when you finally get laid, is uh, <laughs> is uh, 9/11. And uh, you uh, you're apparently are not a big George Bush supporter, I think, is a, a general concept I can share with the people reading this or listening. It would be fair to say that, yeah. Uh, has that, does that go back to day one of the administration, or was there something particular that, that uh, uh, turned you off? I think it predates the uh, administration. I, I felt like uh, George Bush coming up on the election was a, a dangerous character, and um, I was I found it interesting that people thought, oh, well, he's kind of dumb, and it'll, it'll, chances are fairly good that it'll be kind of a slide by administration. And I already thought, like, oh, he seems potentially dangerous. Certainly Cheney seemed extremely dangerous with all his connections to Halliburton and all that. But, um, uh, yeah, I know I, I have been, I, um, it's been a great uh, source of concern and incredible amount of good material that, <laughs> having him as president, unfortunately. Are you surprised by how much it influenced the, uh, the, the kind of the second, well, maybe the, the last third or the <laughs> or, or half of the book? As opposed to, I mean, there's not that much political influence when you're a young man, no, nor is there just when you're actually a young a young person. But, I mean, it really had an impact on the rest of the book, though. Well, yeah, that's true. I mean, there were some references when Reagan is coming in. You know, I'm, I'm lying there with my girlfriend and, and worrying about, you know, whether we'll – sleep together and whether, you know, what she doesn't see me as confident as she once did, and will Reagan be elected? <laughs> right. So, you know, it's like the trifecta of concern. <laughs> but, um, yeah, they, you know, it, it's a combination of things, of course, getting getting older and, and being a parent. I'm, uh, the politics is less and less abstract. What, what somebody does and the impact it's going to have on my life is gets clearer and clearer as time goes by. Um, but, uh the, the everything that was going on with the Bush administration, and then, of course, 9/11 and all the events that passed in there—the Iraq War and Katrina and all the other. It, I mean, I'll, my intent with the book was to ha- have it be somewhat of a historical document that it was going to that was going to cover 1995 to 2005, and that in reading that book, you you could get an idea of what that time period was like. And I tried to put that into the book, and of course. What you know, something like 9/11, living in New York City, that was a huge impact. Mm. Um, and it was very hard. Even, I mean, the title of the book, "Stop Forgetting to Remember," was in part about how, with say, an event like 9/11, at the time, my mental state and a lot of people's mental state was a certain way um, that, you know, say, I just thought, well, we're just very close to the end now, and I was, you know, ready to um, say I didn't want to to um, buy a two-year membership on my website because I figured, well, why spend the money now? And I'll just get a one-year membership because I'll be dead in a year. Mm-hmm. And that, you know, that kind of feeling and fear. And then after a few years, having that not be part of it, having that, that shift. And it, it was so, it's so easy to forget these different mental states from different time periods, from our youth, from, you know, when, when a, there's a moment in time like 9-11. And so I was trying to capture that, that information and and also parenting as, as part of that is the idea that, you know, you get so much information that you you ha- are having at the time of the experience, and then it sort of fades away, and you just sort of barely remember the poopy diapers, and and then next thing you know, you're telling your kid not to do drugs, even though you may very well have done plenty. <laughs> and uh, um, and that, that's another, another whole piece of the book is, is the idea that, you know, as you get older, there's this tendency to get, you know, you, you sort of reject, well, I survived it, but you never would you know, mm-hmm. with your with your child, and um, that I'm trying to remind myself that that's not true. That whole uh, yeah, you kids got it easy. I had to walk three miles in the snow. Of course, we lift gravel every night, and my dad beat me about the face and neck. And... I slept on the floor, and it was real floor. It was gr- it was earthen. It was earth. <laughs> we didn't have blankets or fancy sheets. Uh, <laughs> or food or water. Yeah, we didn't have. We had nothing. I don't know why I'm even here. Uh, uh, do you do you worry about? It seems like you do. Do you worry about the uh, uh, the society that your daughter is going to inherit now? And do you? I mean, is, does that give you literally? Does it give you nightmares, or is it just a waking concern? Uh, um, yeah, unfortunately, it's a, it's a waking concern, and then I go to sleep into the into the nightmares, my, my per- perpetual reoccurring 
end of the world nuclear bomb dream that I've had since I was about eight when I first saw the movie Failsafe mm. and realized that there was this thing out there that could just blow up and that would be that. Um, yeah, I, I've, I, I'm very concerned. I mean, part we we moved to Mexico for what was going to be a year, but it's going to turn is now um, we've extended to two years, and in part just to get a little breather, and in part to um, have really uh, condensed time with our daughter, so that we're the time isn't just going to slip away, which it, it does no matter what, um, and. Uh, uh, but uh, yeah, getting out from, getting a little distance from uh, Bush World and, and the United States was was part of that idea. Um, of course, ironically, we arrived in Mexico just as uh, there was an election where there was suspect and uh, and there was an exploding uh, political situation here in Oaxaca where um, the, there was a st- teacher strike which lasted for six months. Um, and uh, people were getting killed, including an American journalist, Brad Will. And uh, there was the federal troops were surrounding the Sokolo. And uh, so I left the calm of the United States for the uh, <laughs> intensity of, uh, of Oaxaca's political exploding situation and concluded, you know, it, it's not, you, you can't really go anywhere away from these things per se. And, um, um, and then, um, and also that, uh, you know, it is all one world after all. Um, and also that I, uh, I like there to be something that, you know, not, I'm not looking for a quiet sipping tea in the backyard watching the grass grow. I'm, I'm looking to somehow participate and, and have, have an experience. So in a weird way, all the things that have gone on here in Mexico have been really very, very interesting and, of course, are leading towards the next graphic novel I'm doing. Uh-huh. Is that why you're in Mexico? Um, no, the, uh, again, it was really primarily so that our daughter would have a uh, the experience of a second language. Mm. Um, and um, when I was 10, uh, my parents had a year uh, sabbatical in Israel. And uh, um, unfortunately, that was about the most useless language to learn. <laughs> And, so, like, there's an old lady on the on the eighth floor that loved talking to me with you know with Yiddish and Hebrew mixed together, but it was it was it wasn't something I could use a lot, but it did give me a, a much broader world view to live in another country and realize all of the different possibilities uh, and how people behave that's different than the United States and different cultures and all that. And of course, that's hinted at. Well, that's not not just hinted at. That is in the book that you uh, you went you went to Israel and your parents uh, put you in an Israeli school and to sink or swim and you sank. I, I think. And I sank. Yeah. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask you about uh, the, you, you mentioned a little while ago about how the world had changed and and uh, you do spy versus spy for mad. Now, in looking back at that, I remember that you know for years. I mean, I, I grew up in the, in the '60s and the '70s, and spy versus spy. Of course, the, the origination of that is the whole Cold War thing. Doesn't that seem like such a quaint concept now compared to what we're <laughs> what we what we lose sleep about at night now? Yeah, yeah, it, uh, I mean, it has its nature. Although, you know, with the Cuban Missile Crisis and whatnot, they were, that was pretty close to the edge, too. But, uh, um, yeah, they, I mean, in a certain way, they're living in this, uh, in the Cold War, war world, although now it's, they call it the lukewarm war world. <laughs> but uh, um, the, uh, they still, you know, provide the opportunity to basically talk about the, um, the fact that, that the, the winner is, you know, and the next strip is the loser and that it's sort of a, you know the yin yang circular motion that takes place with them. Not to give it too much freight, but um, uh, so that that's sort of still can exist in there. And it's but it, it, it's it's more itchy and scratchy than than Kennedy and Khrushchev at this point. How, how long have you been doing it? Um, uh, Eleven years. Um, oh, they're, wow. they're about to come out with a uh, um, a, a new spy casebook that covers my first decade working on it, which I'm absolutely shocked to look at the clock and realize it's been that long. Wow. Now, now who did it immediately before you? Um, there was a few other people. I think um, uh, Bob Clark did some of them. Um, they, they had a few different artists that were sort of uh, intermediary, but they, they basically were, were um, trying to do Prohias as the creator's style. And when when uh, they asked me if I wanted to try out for it, they were. It seemed to me that they were, they were looking for some 
possible alteration, and I certainly wasn't going to be interested in doing it if it was, uh, you know, just trying to mimic uh, somebody else's style. And so I, I gave it a shot with doing it in stencils, where I actually cut paper and use spray paint, and then go back in with watercolor and all this mixed media. And um, that I thought, well, if they're going to, if they want me to tr do this, I mean, if I'm going to do this, I, sh I should really, in some way, try to make it my own, um, because it, it just felt a little late in my career to be, um, you know, subsuming into uh, another style. Mm. And uh, and it worked out, you know, really beautifully. I mean, I was happily they were that they were looking for that, and right maybe at the point that I, I might have sort of lost my wind, the mad went to color, and uh, which a lot of people probably don't even know happened, <laughs> um, and. Um, that gave me a whole range of possibilities of, of using color. I mean, blood's red, and it just explodes there. So, is it is it cool to be doing something that's such a legendary? Uh, I mean, it's really iconic. Um, yeah, absolutely. It's it's like I mean, aside from the fact that I was a huge Mad fan, and that was a major influence on you know the kind of work I ended up doing, mm -hmm. the idea of humor and politics, and you know, and, and laughing at pretty much everything. Um, but uh, it, it's in a lot of ways, it's like a dialogue with my ten-year-old self. Because <laughs> I, when I do it, I really I, I do it thinking about there's some kid that's reading this, and the details that I put into it that really mattered to me when I was a kid. And you know, you see that in a lot. Of, Mad has that very much going. Is is this idea that adults are putting all this energy into working on these things? They'll put a little uh, bone on the floor. Or there's something flying by in the background or whatever, all these details that you think, you know, who, who's saying, making them do that? And it's just that desire to make it matter and make it like a something that's uh, not just, well, it's for kids, so, you know, you don't have to really worry about those kind of details because they won't notice. I, I always noticed those things um, when, when I was younger, and so now is my opportunity to basically, you know, continue that, that, uh, that process. And and, it's, and that part of it is a real joy. How does your workload uh, split these these days in terms of when you're working on a graphic novel versus Mad, or you're working on? Uh, I, I'm assuming you're still doing some newspaper and magazine illustration. Mm -hmm. Well, now in Mexico, I'm working at about one third speed. It just seems to do that. <laughs> but um, and uh, you know the overhead is so much lower than New York City. It was it, you know you had to scramble just to keep up in New York. Right. And uh, which I'm going to return to and very happily so. But. Um, Matt, uh, Spy vs. Spy is two pages every month, and which can, comes around at a rather l alarming speed. If you <laughs> finish one and immediately have to come up with another one, and I rarely ever get fully ahead. Um, so, so that that takes about a week of my month. And then, if I'm doing a graphic novel like Stop Forgetting, that was such an enormous amount of um, work to do. It's 208 pages, and I, there was a lot of work. Uh, half toning it and adding a second color and just lettering and everything that I was working kind of around the clock on that whenever I had the opportunity for you know a year or a year and a half and then in between those things I'm, I'm, I'm you know if an illustration job comes along um, I'll do that down here I get periodic calls from from different magazines but um, generally I can focus on spy versus spy I'm doing a lot of work in my sketchbook here about what's going on politically, which I then, in turn, am able to send out and uh, I'm, uh, get magazines to run. And um, that you know, it's just this strange combination of cobbling together a uh, a living from from doing things that I'm interested in doing. And uh, but um, overall, you know, the, including Spy vs. Spy, it, it seems to be mostly the fun part of of the spectrum. Hmm. And uh, as we uh, close in on winding up here, what uh, what's ahead? Is there another book in the pipeline? Is there any news on uh, uh, The Virgin, for example, or Richie Bush? Um, well, I'm going to be uh, – I have uh, – I'm formulating a follow-up book to Stop Forgetting, which is going to be oh. uh, the same way that, that Stop Forgetting has a through story that covers 1995 to 2005 with all these uh, – going down all these other roads of past experience. This is going to be about moving to Mexico and then go off on the side experiences of travel because I did lots and lots of travel, including eight months traveling around Africa and Southeast Asia with my wife and um, a lot of other trips to New Guinea and, and, uh, um, and around. And those will all, will all sort of figure into 
just the as the sideline stories, but the idea of, of moving to another country, which where we stepped into this exploding political situation, will be part of it. Hmm. And um, uh, that that's so that that is one one of the things I'm formulating. And then I've just been yeah, keeping various sketchbooks and um, periodically sell something from that. Like most recently, I did a condom design that was a Mexican wrestler, which somehow seemed appropriate. <laughs> I just want to make sure we hear that correctly. That is a condom design. Yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> you can find it on the web. They're, they're for sale. And uh, it's the Lucha Libre, which is the uh, free, it's like the big time wrestling. Those are wrestlers with the, those great masks. And uh, so there's my, my first condom is available now. <laughs> oh, Somehow dovetails with doing strips about losing, attempting to lose your virginity. Uh, <laughs> carrying condoms around in your wallet for to the point where it's like from the pre-Cambrian period. I said that's 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 in the book. I was going to say there's a, there's a there's a there's a line in the book about looking you know who has a condom looking for a condom. So <laughs> seems strangely appropriate. Um, all right. Well, uh, Peter, thank you so much for joining us on Mr. Media this week. My pleasure. Uh, if you're interested in more about Peter, you can go to his website, Peter Cooper, and that's. K U P E R dot com, Peter Cooper dot com. Um, and if you'd like to keep up with Mr. Media's Friday interviews, you can subscribe to the site via email at www dot mrmedia dot com. You can also subscribe to the audio feed in the podcast section of iTunes. Thanks for joining us. Please come back next week for another Fridays with Mr. Media.